Yeah, I want to thank Steve and Jeremy and the rest of the crew for inviting me and for putting this together. A hand of applause uh, for them. But I really, I'm, I, I can't wait to get back to the cleanliness and serenity of the city of Philadelphia after having been here. Steve, don't send me back. I'll wash your car. I'll change your infusion set, whatever it takes. All right, I hope you all had some caffeine. This isn't the sexiest of topics, but I think it'll be a useful one for a lot of people here. How many of you look at your blood sugar after you've eaten? All right. How many are scared mercilessly by what you see after you eat? Yeah, it's, it's a pretty common thing. That little squiggly graphic at the top left of the screen, that, that's what this is about. We're trying to turn that little red graph into the little green graph. We want to try to minimize the variability of the big peak that takes place after meals. And if your glucose is high three to four hours after a meal, you just didn't take enough. But the issue most of us have to deal with is what happens in between, is that big spike and then the sudden drop that takes place. So that's what we're going to focus on for the next half hour or so. Oh, please work. There we go. Now, this is an overview. We're going to define what we mean by these peaks, what the risks are, what the problems are caused by postprandial spikes, how we measure them, but we'll spend most of our time on strategies for managing these post-meal spikes. Uh, we define this as the net rise that occurs from pre-meal to the highest point you reach post-meal. So a lot of people used to say, well, how do I know when to check to see when it's the highest point? And my answer is use a CGM because that will really show you clearly how high you peaked after your meal. It's, it's a guessing game otherwise, knowing when to check. The American Diabetes Association has established a goal of keeping glucoses below 180, one to two hours post-meal for people with diabetes. The Association of Clinical Endocrinologists recommends keeping below 140 at the two-hour point. The European group recommends below 165, and the International Diabetes Federation recommends keeping below 140. I'm happy if I'm below these numbers before I eat, much less after I eat. And none of these organizations give you one freaking clue about how to do it. You say, yeah, you should be at this level after you eat, but you figure it out, right? Isn't that, they don't give you any, any ideas. I think the glucose goals really do need to be individualized a little better. We can't treat everyone the same way. In kids, we're usually happy if they're in the low 200s or below. There's only so much you can achieve with young children. Uh, with adults, yeah, generally, yeah, we can keep below 180 to 200, keep it under that level at the post-meal peak. That's pretty good. And you know, during pregnancy, we have more stringent goals. We try to keep below 140. That's not easy to do, trust me. Uh, now, this is data from many years ago. This is when CGM was first being utilized, and Yale Med Center took a whole slew of kids who were being managed intensively, put them on CGM, because they wanted to see what do the post-meal blood sugars look like. The average peak blood sugar after breakfast was 293. The average after lunch was 291, and at dinner it was 280. It makes you feel a little better about yours, doesn't it? I know it made me feel better. What are some of the problems created by these post-meal spikes? It makes us tired. We can all relate to this. This is that after the Thanksgiving me uh, meal feeling. High glucose really does sap our energy. It makes us very lethargic. It makes it hard to concentrate. So if you have, uh, have to work after a meal, if you have a class after a meal, it creates challenges. It affects physical performance, strength stamina, speed, flexibility, these are all influenced negatively by spikes in the blood sugar level. We don't want to move. You know, it, it's a situation where we really do become a bit lazy when blood sugars are up. We don't have much desire to move. And I know the partners here will, can relate to this. Moods change. You ever seen your partner's mood change when their blood sugar goes real high? Yeah, that happened. It's the first thing out of my wife's mouth. When I'm acting a little out of sorts, it's check your damn blood sugar. She knows something is up. And here's a beautiful thing. It makes us hungry. High blood sugar stimulates the appetite center of the brain. We seem to crave food when we're hungry. So when you put all this together, 
we're tired, we're sluggish, we're bad mood, we don't want to move, our mood's lousy, it turns us into big slugs. This is how it feels to have these spiking blood sugars after meal. Who knows who that is? Good, job of the hut. Yeah, you type big slug in a search engine, this is the only thing that comes up. And there are long-term effects as well. Uh, hemoglobin A1Cs are affected by post-meal control. In fact, the tighter you want to get your A1C, the more attention you have to pay to the post-meal values. You can get your A1C into the mid-7s and 8s and not worry that much about it. But if you want to get into a nice, healthier range, you have to pay attention to those post-meal blood sugars. This is data again. This is a long, long, uh, long ago study looking at the development of early stages of kidney disease. And they found that the patients who had glucose is persistently above 200 developed the early signs of kidney disease in half the time it took people with uh, post-meal glucose under 200. This was a study looking at how glucose variability, uh, there's a measure called MAGE, and mean, mean amplitude of glucose excursions. It's the peak, the spike. People who had bigger spikes had more risk for microvascular complications than those with lower spikes, even with identical A1C levels. So the post-meal glucose levels do matter for long-term health. Macrovascular, large blood vessel diseases are also influenced by post-meal spikes. Glucose is regularly above 200, raise the risk for heart disease by almost 50%. Dementia risk, the effects on the brain, is also uh, amplified when glucose variability increases. So all the discussion about time in range is extremely valuable. We cannot be A1C centric. We have to look at the quality of our glucose control. Why does this happen? What is it about variability in blood sugar that causes all these issues? We don't really know. There are a lot of proposed mechanisms involved, involving oxidative stress and coagulation of blood cells and this and that, and inner linings of blood vessels being affected. We don't really understand completely, but we do know that there are short-term effects on how we feel and perform, and there are long-term effects in our, in our health affected by these post-meal blood sugar spikes. So how do we measure them? Well, the old-fashioned way is you do a finger stick. I will say that the average time of a spike in blood sugar, the high point, is about an hour after most meals. Now, that's going to be affected by a lot of variables. You know, what was eaten, when your you know, insulin was given, and what kind of activities you're doing. But if you're using finger sticks, if you're not on a CGM, check your glucose about an hour after you finish a meal and that should be representing approximately what the high point is. Uh, so this is an example of someone who just kind of binge monitored for three days. We have three pre and post breakfast readings, pre and post lunch, pre and post dinner. Now to look at these, you would say, wow, you know, after breakfast, those blood sugars are spiking pretty high. It looks like there's an issue there. After lunch, we have one day where the blood sugar spiked, but look at what the glucose was before the meal. It was low. And as many of you know, a low blood sugar will often produce a high afterwards. It's one of the strategies we're going to talk about for preventing spikes is minimizing low blood sugars going into meals. That helps reduce spikes. After dinner, we have a couple of readings that are above 200. But look at what the glucose was before dinner. It was already elevated. It really didn't go up. So you have to consider the context of these things, and not just the number, but what it was leading up to it. Was it high to start? Was it low beforehand? Before you can come to any real conclusions. You know, I would look at this. I would say, well, breakfast does appear to be a problem. We need to focus in on that. Lunch and dinner, maybe. We need to collect some more data. You know, ultimately, CGM is the, is the optimal way to evaluate postprandial glucose levels. And I do prefer looking at either individual day graphs or the, the spaghetti graph that you saw before that looks so frightening. The problem with using that summary graph, the ambulatory glucose profile, is that that graph kind of assumes that you're eating and taking insulin at the exact same times every day. Raise your hand if you eat your meals at the exact same times every day. 
What? Okay, it's real life. We don't do that. And though, if you're eating at different times, this, the peak is not going to show up nice and neatly on those summary graphs. You have to look at the spaghetti report to see where those peaks are happening. So this is a, a one-day graph. And this was actually my very first experience wearing a CGM. This was back in 2005 or something. It was a while back. It was one of those big black boxy CGMs that had a cable and the sensor was enormous that went in the skin. You couldn't even see your data. It just stored it and you could download it after three days of wear. But when I saw these graphs, I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Nowadays, this is, you know, this is routine. But the post-meal peaks really stood out to me. This was an eight-year-old girl uh, whose A1C was a bit higher than what we expected based on her pre-meal readings. And it's because she was spiking up to a, almost 300 after most of her meals. And you know, this is a woman with type 2 diabetes just taking oral meds. Her fasting blood sugars were beautiful. Her pre-lunches were beautiful. But between the two, not so beautiful. There's also a lab test that can be done called a 1,5-AG or a glycomark. Has anyone heard of this test? A handful of you. This test is measuring an enzyme that's depleted in your bloodstream whenever you spill sugar in the urine. So this enzyme gets spilled along with the sugar whenever your blood sugars are high. And typically that happens when glucose gets above about 180. So if you spend a lot of time above 180, this enzyme becomes depleted. So we measure this, and if you have a low score on this, that's bad. It's not like an A1C, it's the opposite. A low glycomark means you've been peaking above 180 frequently. So somebody who has an A1C of 6.7 and a really lousy glycomark score, we know, even without sensor data, that there's a lot of spiking taking place. So that's where that test can be used. So why do you think we spike? Think about this. The tools that we're using really don't match normal physiology. The insulin that we use, and I love that they call it rapid-acting insulin. When your body makes insulin, you know how long it takes to start working? Seconds. I mean, it works fast. It hits the liver. It circulates to the rest of the body. It clears from the body through the kidneys it, within a few minutes, typically. That's rapid. The rapid insulins we use start working in 15 minutes. They might peak in an hour, hour and a half, and they, they usually take about you know, four hours to clear in most cases. That's not so rapid. That's rapider than regular. It's just not rapid, rapid. So that's a problem. Another problem is that ordinarily in a pancreas that's producing insulin, that insulin keeps the pancreas from making glucagon at the same time. Somebody whose pancreas doesn't make insulin may produce glucagon when we're eating meals, and that's going to drive the blood sugar up as well. And then we have a problem of food working too quickly, because having type 1 diabetes means that we lack two hormones, not just one. We, we lack the insulin hormone, but we also lack a second hormone called amylin. Amylin is normally made by our beta cells along with insulin, and it plays a key role in regulating appetite and rate of digestion. And without the amylin hormone, food digests faster than it should. We lack another hormone called GLP-1, and that also regulates rate of digestion. So we have this kind of you know, perfect storm scenario of food that's working faster than it should, and insulin that's working much slower than it should. It's a you know, tortoise and a hare analogy. We have to figure out a way to either make the tortoise a lot faster or make the hare a lot slower. And those are the strategies we use to control post-meal glucose. So one way we can slow food down is by paying attention to something called glycemic index. Glycemic index is a term that came into being, I think it was in the late 90s, there's a research group down in Australia that studies different food types to examine their effect on blood sugar. And what they're looking for specifically is how much the glucose rises within two hours after consuming a certain food. So the number associated with these foods represents the percentage of the carbs that turn to glucose within two hours. The remainder kicks in after two hours. So a low glycemic index food is going to hit the bloodstream fast. 
It's going to spike the blood sugar fairly quickly. Spaghetti is a relatively low glycemic index food. You might think, what? How could that be? Now, I didn't say a low carb food. It's a high carb food. However, the carbs in pasta tend to take a long time to absorb and digest. You don't see a sudden spike when you eat pasta. It's a long, gradual kind of effect. You know, their score for it is 37. It's going to be affected by a lot of things. You know, how, how well cooked it is, is it whole grain or not? But with a score of 37, on average, only about a third of the carbs have hit the bloodstream in the first two hours. That's relatively slow. The rest is going to kick in after two hours. And there's a lot of variables in foods that can affect uh, how quickly they digest. Um, fiber tends to slow down digestion of foods. Uh, fat slows down digestion. Solids tend to be slower than liquids. Cold foods are slower than hot. And there's certain types of sugars and starches that just naturally digest faster than others. For example, lactose, which is found in dairy products, is a fairly slow-acting carbohydrate. That's why you know, milk is not a very good treatment for hypoglycemia. It takes a, a while to kick in. You know, compared to dextrose, which is in the tablets and Smarties and sweet tarts and things like that, those work super quick. Those turn to glucose very, very rapidly. So one research study looking at this compared people who ate rice and potatoes to combining those foods with lentils. Lentils or any kind of legumes have very low glycemic index scores. Beans, nuts, peas, lentils are really slow to digest. And just having a 50-50 split of rice and lentils or potatoes and lentils instead of having all potato or all rice, greatly diminished the post-meal blood sugar spike. It knocked an average of about 30 points off the post-meal peak that occurred after eating those meals. Now, I'm not going to suggest that you go and memorize every glycemic index score. There's hundreds of foods they've done tests on. I, I like to categorize foods, though. Some foods are just naturally very fast. Some are naturally slow, and everything else kind of morphs into the middle. The slow stuff includes, you know, pasta. I mentioned legumes. Uh, veg most vegetables except potatoes. Uh, dairy products and chocolate. Chocolate. Mm, nice and slow to digest. All right. The fast stuff, we're looking at breads, snack chips, crackers, white potatoes, white rice, um, cereals. So a lot of things we eat for breakfast tend to be high glycemic index. So think about substitutions you might be able to make. If you usually have cereal in the morning, consider oatmeal, uh, or even better, consider yogurt. Much, much slower. So even without eliminating carbs, just choosing slower digesting carbs can be helpful. So these are examples of some different substitutions that can be made. Uh, you know, for example, uh, for a snack, instead of eating pretzels or chips, have popcorn or have ice cream. I mean, these are not things that you are suffering with here, chocolate and ice cream. But they're much slower to digest, and you won't get as much of a blood sugar spike with these things. With uh, dinner foods, think of you know, some of the side dishes. If you normally have white potatoes, have sweet potatoes. This is one of the great ironies of diabetes. Sweet potatoes are so much better for us than white potatoes. They, they are, because they're very high in fiber. Another strategy for slowing a meal down is not eating it all at one time. We call this splitting the meal. So if you were to have uh, a meal that has, let's say, 60 grams of carb, you could have 30 grams now, 30 grams in an hour, hour and a half, and take all of your insulin up front. Because the insulin's taking several hours to work. You don't need all the food at one time, though. Okay, so now I got creative with PowerPoint. Now, a sandwich like this, what do you call that? No, it's a hoagie. Right? <laughs> so if you were having a hoagie, let's say a nice you know, 10-inch hoagie, here you go, you ready? PowerPoint animation. You can have half the sandwich now. Ready, ready? And half later... And give your insulin up front, though. So if you're having 80 grams, bolus for the 80 grams before you eat anything. But you don't have to eat it all at once. Eat some of it now and save some of it for a snack. Just don't forget to eat the rest later or you know what will happen. 
Physical activity after a meal is also beneficial for slowing down the rate of digestion. When blood flow is being sent to your muscles, less of it is going to the stomach and the intestines. So food digests more slowly and absorbs more slowly. You'll see less of a spike after the meal. Uh, acidity slows down digestion. Vinegar in particular, a couple of spoons of vinegar will greatly slow down digestion. Uh, they found that the 60-minute post-meal glucose response is cut almost in half or more than in half by having vinegar with a meal. But any, any acidic foods, tomatoes, sourdough products, this is why sourdough bread is a better option than regular breads because it, it has some acidic properties to it. The sequence in which you eat matters. When you have a mixed meal, eat the protein and the veggies first and then eat the carbs. The protein and veggies form this kind of gel matrix in the stomach and in the beginning of the small intestine, and it slows down the absorption of the carbohydrates. There are medical approaches that can also be used. There's a medication called an alpha-glucosidase inhibitor, which slows down the absorption of carbohydrates from the intestines. Uh, so we see a much more gradual blood sugar rise after meals just from taking a pill. But, there's a big but, you will be the gassiest person in history. If you can accept that and if your partner is okay with that, go for it. There's another oral medication called a DPP-4 inhibitor. And these medications increase the level of another type of hormone called the GLP-1. Let me get to that in a moment. The GLP-1s, and traditionally these are taken by injection, but there is an oral version on the short-term horizon. This is a replacement for a hormone normally produced by the lining of the intestines. When food comes through, this hormone is produced and it slows down digestion. It's your intestines way of saying, we're full, don't push a lot of food through. It blunts appetite as well. So a lot of people with type 1 use these medications to improve post-meal control and to keep their hunger at bay. There's another hormone called Simlin. Uh, this is a copy of that amylin hormone that I mentioned earlier. It's basically the same hormone, just the, the, that's the brand name for it. This is a very potent tool for slowing digestion. Uh, and blocking appetite. But, you know, there's a lot of side effects with this one, a lot of nausea. Anyone here ever try Simlin? Anyone still on it? There's your answer. It, it's a challenging medication to use, but it, it, of, of all the things out there, it is by far and away the most potent one for eliminating that post-meal spike. Uh, Simlin works by, again, slowing digestion. Gastric emptying time takes about twice as long, even on a low dose of Simlin. And glucagon is also suppressed, so you're not producing glucagon inappropriately after meals when Simlin is taken. I mentioned the low blood sugars as a source of a spike. If you're regularly low or even borderline low going into a meal, there's a good chance your glucose is going to spike too high because gastric emptying accelerates when we're low. We want that. When our blood sugar is low, we want our food to digest fast. We want the blood sugar to come up quickly. But if you're about to go into a meal and you're 73 or 68 or something, you don't really need that. So avoidance of hypoglycemia has another benefit in that it can help prevent the big spikes following meals. Now, to get the insulin to work faster, we need to choose as fast an insulin as possible. And you know, regular insulin, which you know, that's what I got started, Steve got started with regular insulin, it, it, it's, too, it's much too slow. I mean, the, the rapid stuff we use is too slow. Regular is much too slow. That has a peak of two to three hours and lasts six to eight hours. So using the rapid analogs at least is better than using regular. But we have another option now with FIOSP. This is a new insulin that Novo Nordisk introduced in the U.S. last year. It's been used in other countries for, a, for many years. Um, th this is essentially Novolog with an ingredient, an ingredient called niacinamide. And the niacinamide makes the insulin absorb a little bit faster below the skin. So it peaks about eight minutes earlier. During the first hour, it works about almost twice as hard as normal Novolog does. The duration of action is the same. So if you used it in a pump, you wouldn't change your duration of action but you would get it a little bit earlier onset of the insulin. 
Now, just as a warning, there have been multiple reports of pump users having some issues using FIOSP in their pumps after an extended period of time, some site issues. Uh, it doesn't happen to everybody, but if you, if you try it and start to notice some irregular absorption, you, you may need to switch back to a traditional uh, Humalog or Novolog product. The timing of our boluses is another big deal. I still remember the day that the Lily rep came to my practice and when Humalog was being introduced. And he said, Gary, if you're going to use this stuff or your patients are going to use it, the food had better be on your fork near your mouth when you take this insulin because it is a lot faster. It's really fast. All right. That's not exactly true, is it? Uh, the insulin doesn't start doing anything for about 15 minutes. So it's necessary to pre-dose this stuff if you want to manage your blood sugars effectively, particularly when you're eating foods that are going to digest pretty quickly. You know, it's a different situation. You know, again, if you're having a pasta meal or if you're going to eat half a pizza, but if you're eating a fast digesting meal, plan to take your Humalog at least or Novolog at least 15 minutes ahead of time. And it does make a difference. Even back in the, you know, 15 years ago, my first CGM graph when I was dosing my insulin on the fork, you know, right when I ate, and then when I started pre-dosing, it really helped to level things out. The timing does matter. This, again, the research from 15 years ago showing that pre-meal insulin dosing reduced the post-meal peak by about 40 points. And it also has effects on A1C. As we mentioned earlier, to really get to those tight A1Cs of like seven and less, you got to pay attention to the post meals. And this showed how taking the insulin before meals uh, cuts the A1C back, in this case, uh, by about 0.4%. Uh, warming your infusion or injection site will also make the insulin work faster. Warming the skin brings blood flow to the skin surface and the insulin picks up much quicker. You can take a hot bath, a hot shower, you can put a warm compress on, or get your partner to massage you. And I say, you know, it might help, it can't hurt. So, now this was interesting. This was a product that was in development several years ago. It was an infusion set that had a heating filament built into it. It was like hunting socks for a pump user. There was a big battery attached that would heat up the site when insulin uh, was delivered. It just wasn't very practical because you had this massive battery you had to lug around. It, I don't think it was like a toaster oven infusion set in one. The, your, your site choice can make a difference. Now, with, with rapid analogs, there's not a huge difference in terms of where you would give the insulin, but it does absorb a little bit faster on the arm and on the abdomen than on the hips and the legs and the buttocks. Uh, Alfrez has been mentioned several times this weekend, and this is the in inhaled insulin developed by mankind. Uh, and this is very, very fast insulin. And th the speed of this solves one problem, but it sometimes creates another because sometimes it works too quickly. You may have to split it into two parts. You may have to delay it quite a bit also with slowly digesting meals. But with this type of, uh, this inhaled insulin, you start seeing an effect within a couple of minutes after it's inhaled. The peak effect is usually in, in around the 15 to 30 minute range, and most of it clears in about 90 minutes. Larger doses of Afrezza take a little bit longer to clear, but in general, after 90 minutes, it, it's mostly gone. So you can see the potential benefit from that uh, in improving the post-meal blood sugar spikes. Intramuscular injection is another thing people sometimes toy around with. Has anybody here given themselves a shot into muscle on purpose? A fair number. I've talked to a lot of people here who do that. It does sting, I won't lie to you. When you inject into muscle, it's gonna hurt at least for a few moments, but it does work a lot faster. Uh, I was in Europe doing a presentation, it, it, this, this nurse's group. My blood sugar was really high beforehand, and I knew if I was on stage for like two hours and my sugar was high, I, I'd have to pee my brains out. So I wanted to get my blood sugar down fast. So I gave myself a shot into muscle, and this is what my CGM graph, uh, oh, actually I'll show you on the next slide. That's what my CGM graph looked like. I gave the shot right at noon. 
And ordinarily, you give a bolus at 12 noon, how long is it going to take for your blood sugar to get back down all the way to where you want? Three o'clock, four o'clock? I didn't have that kind of time. By 1.30, I was all the way back down to about an 80. It really does work quickly. Yeah. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah. The bill doesn't matter, but you may have to use a longer syringe needle to get it into the muscle. I, I use my forearm. If you make a fist, you can inject the forearm. But if you make sure you get it into muscle, it should do the job. Smoking will slow down the absorption of insulin after it's administered. Blood vessels in the skin constrict. So don't smoke. Uh, skip over the med stuff. Physical activity, again, helps to accelerate insulin absorption. I mentioned before how it slows down digestion, but it also helps insulin absorb faster. So properly timed activity after meals can be very beneficial. This was a, a limited study just looking at 30 minutes of what they call stop and go walking, what I call walking your dog. It stops at every pole and hydrant. And it, it, it knocked the post-meal blood sugars down by an average of 30 points. And it doesn't take a full-bore workout uh, to get this kind of benefit. My wife learned a, a while ago that if I do the dishes after dinner, my sugars are much better. <laughs> Big mistake. So, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do, you know, soon after eating. It's just, you know, routine things around the house, around the yard. Or, you know, in Pepe Le Pew's terms, the art of me. After meals, all right, take advantage of the blood sugar lowering opportunity that you have. So, you know, these post meals, they are important to control for short term performance and how we feel and for preventing long term health problems. We can measure these easily now, and, and we got a lot of management strategies that we can apply. We can slow the food down by choosing our foods wisely, splitting the meals. Yeah, I don't expect you to apply every single one of these strategies, but you know, if you are having peaks in your blood sugar after meals, pick one or two, try it out, see how it works. And what works for you may not work for somebody else. Uh, it might be easy, for example, for you to split a meal if you're having large mixed meals. If you're having small meals or you don't, you don't think you're going to have an opportunity to eat the rest later, that, that's not going to be an option. Uh, but, you know, play around with these. I think if you can manage those post-meal blood sugars, there's like nothing you can't accomplish in terms of your diabetes. So I got this in. This was a 60-minute lecture that I did in about 25. I apologize if I spoke very quickly. Again, thank you all for your time.